I'm Dr. Libby Jones and I work with Gillian at Edinburgh and I'm going to give you a talk today about maybe stardust and you may have heard the phrase we're all made of stardust and so that's what I'm going to get into today. So first of all I'm going to start off with one of my favourite constellations. Does anyone know the name of this? Yeah, you're out? Orion. Orion, great. Has anyone seen it in the night sky? <coughs> Hands up? Anyone seen it? Great. I love Orion because it tells me an awful lot of the science in a very small area of the sky, and which we want to use you to do to look at larger galaxies. Now, I'm not a fan of the optical wavelengths, um, because in the optical we can see lots of bright blue stars, and mostly stars, but I really like dust. And to go to dust, we need to go to the infrared. So this is Orion as you normally see it in visible wavelengths. So look up in the night sky, you'll see something like this without the lines, obviously. If we go to the infrared, we get a completely different pi picture of the same constellation. So how about a game of spot the difference? Apart from, obviously, the difference in red colour versus the black sky, can anyone notice anything different between the two images? There's three stars in the middle line on the one left. There's only, is it only two bright yellow bits on the, on the right? You are right on it. All the stars, apart from this very red star right at the top, are not visible in the infrared. These are really hot stars, these blue stars, and they don't emit at infrared wavelengths. What you do see instead is you may have heard that in Orion there's lots of stars that are, uh, stars that are forming. And so these form in these bright regions here. You get a lot of star formation going on. You get all these dust lanes at the top. Um, around and about where all the dust is colliding and then there's this one star in the very top corner this red supergiant called Betelgeuse and this is a massive star but it's very cool that's why it's red and that is very dusty so that is also seen you can see <coughs> over here this star in the optical it's the only star that you can still see in the infrared now this star is massive and just to give you an idea of how massive it is this is the picture of the star surface using far infrared telescopes on the ground and so this is Betelgeuse, that star in Orion you can see every night. The sun is in the centre. The Earth, the orbit of the Earth, is right here. So if you're on the Earth and you're anywhere near this star, you stand no chance. You have to go all the way out, past Jupiter, sort of between Jupiter and Saturn in our solar system. Does that give you an idea of how big this star is in terms of the sky? But I really like Betelgeuse, not because you can see it like this or see it in the infrared, my view of Betelgeuse is slightly different. It looks like this. This is what I look at with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is the previous generation of telescopes in space before James Webb gets launched. And this is my view. So this is a spectra of wavelength and then brightness up here. And this is what I see. I see dust with Spitzer, this small telescope that took a spectra of lots of stars in the sky. And to give you an idea of what we're really seeing, is this is the type of dust we see. So this really massive star, this red star, but is very cool, has these bumps here, which is created by sand, silicate dust, sand, like you find on the beach, tiny, tiny particles of sand. You get a little dip here, that's due to silicon monoxide. It looks like coal on there, but that's a really fine wispy powder. It's really hard to find a picture. I don't think it's very common on Earth. You can get this thing is kind of triangular shaped as well, so I know there's a bit of alumina. So alumina, in its normal form, doesn't sound very exciting, but if it's crystal, if it's crystal, then it's sapphire or ruby. So what I'm looking here is a sandy star with a bit of ruby slash sapphire. If you get a little peek here, you know there's lots of ruby and sapphire. And then a bit further down, you can also get some peaks and squiggles down here, and that's from iron and olivine. And olivine, you may know more commonly as jade. So what I've got here is a sandy, rubyish star with a bit of jade and possibly some iron. That's what Betelgeuse is. Next time you look at it in the night sky, think of it as a really sandy star rather than this big red thing that you can see. So how is this dust around these stars? How did it even get there? So what you have are these red stars at the end of their life. They're dying and they're cooling down. They can't make enough material in the core, so it's not as high temperatures. So they start getting cooler. And what happens is they start to expand. So the atmosphere expands, it starts to pulsate because the nuclear stuff in the centre is becoming unstable, and it starts producing molecules. So this is the centre of the star, we've got our red star, this is the stuff of space in between, and then as you go away from the star it gets cooler. 
And as you get cooler, you can start forming stuff like titanium oxide, water, so water starts forming on the star, and most importantly of all, carbon monoxide. This is really important. So we've got these poisonous stars, they're dying, they're producing sand, but this is what happens. So they're, they're expanding, they're pulsating, things are getting levitating. As you go further away from the star, you can start forming dust. And this happens around 1000 Kelvin, so around 725 degrees Celsius. So I mean, I'm talking cool stars here. You may not think it's cool, but that's cool in terms of stars. And what happen, what's happened is you get further away, it's sort of like rain condensing, it's like dust condensing. So instead of forming water, like today, you're forming solids. So you get your molecules, then you start forming alumina. So again, your rubies, sapphires, and that blue rocky things, and your silicates, so your jade and your sand. And then further away, you can possibly get some iron. And that's what we can see in their signatures. But that's not the end of the story, because I'm going to have you looking not for stars like this, but I'm also looking, getting you to look at carbon stars. And what happens towards the centre of the star is it's still burning a bit. So it's no longer burning helium, it's burning hydrogen. Sorry, it's no longer burning hydrogen, it's burning helium. And with the helium, you get some carbon forming. And that carbon can be, these stars, again, are very unstable, they're pulsating, they can be brought up to the surface. And at some point, what happens is then you can start forming carbon stars. So there's one, it's like a switch being flipped. At one point, it's forming sand. The next thing, it's forming carbon. And everything changes. And the reason why that happens is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is really, really stable. It's a nightmare to get rid of. It's absolutely fantastic, though, because it either locks up all the carbon, so you have more carbon around, and you've got more oxygen, you have a lot more oxygen, all the carbon's hidden away in carbon monoxide. But if you switch it round, and you have more carbon than oxygen, then all the, car all the oxygen is hidden away in carbon monoxide, and you've just got all this carbon left to form. Now, without oxygen, you can't form silicates, you can't form alumina, you can't form iron. Um, you need to then have a different type of chemistry. So what happens then is instead of a sandy star, you get this star that's surrounded by soot instead. So you get a source of carbon monoxide still, you get PAHs, which is the thing that catalytic converters in cars try and get rid of, it's the not complete combustion, and then you get amorphous carbon, so soot, then you've got your graphite, which is in your pens, and then you get silicon carbide, and I don't think I have any nice pictures of silicon carbide. But so this is how you get a dusty star. You get your oxygen stars, which are sandy, or your carbon stars, which are sooty. And this is what you guys are hopefully going to help me find, because these have rubies and diamonds, these have rubies and sapphires, and these things may have diamonds. So hopefully we can find some of these in all the spectra you're going to be looking at. And then what happens then is all this, this is where we're made from stardust, is the dust is produced by stars, it's lost into the interstellar space, um, and it's going at a slow wind, it's about 10 kilometers per second, which is 22,000 miles an hour, is this, this wind of this dust being pushed into space. And within around 10,000 years, there's no envelope left. You've got no, nothing left, all you've got is the core in the center. The star is gone. And this is when it's like towards the really end of its life. You've got nothing left apart from the core, and all your stardust has been pushed into space. So, what happens then? So, for a star like Betelgeuse, which is a red supergiant, that's going to either explode, or, at, well, at some point it's going to explode. And then the dust, it's either going to destroy all the dust it's produced already and make some more in the supernova, and that's going to go into a star forming region where more stars are formed and it could go around this high mass cycle again. Or for stars like our sun, instead, a low mass star, it's going to go through the same process, but it's not going to explode. Instead, that wind, it's going to push everything out, and you're going to be left with this beautiful planetary nebula. You may have seen pictures of these in space uh, from NASA or from other telescopes. Do you know when you see a really pretty picture that's released by anyone to do with space? It's probably a planetary nebula, a star forming region. Um, and then that is, you get the core that becomes a white dwarf and cools, but the dust then goes back into the star forming region. You form stars, and that cycle continues over and over and over again until you make all the elements that you see here. So anything that's not hydrogen, helium, or a bit of lithium is actually all made from stars. So any gold, anything you've got on, any platinum, all made from stars. So what we're going to do is I've looked at these two galaxies. These are called the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. 
And these are taken, again, with Spitzer in the infrared. And what you can see here is the bright red. Um, can we see red? Is where all stars are forming. So you have some lots of star formation going on here. The blue are your stars. So stars, you get some of the stars. And then the, the stuff in between is the interstellar medium, the bit in between space. Uh, the bit in between all the stars, which stars form, and the dying stars pull that stuff into. And so with that, I looked at lots of um, objects. There's 10 million stars in there. You can't see 10 million stars, but there is 10 million, trust me. And then from that, we took uh, over 1,000 spectra. And from all those spectra, me and my team of about 50 people, so about this, went through all of these spectra, found out what they all are, we look for the dying stars, we look for the carbon stars, we look for the stars that are forming. And we made a way to separate them out. And so we came up with something like this. Um, so we classified everything. And then to put together these things up here, these are stars right in the earliest stages of formation. And so we're going to have a look out for some of these today. And you can tell that they're forming because they have this water ice feature here, 15 microns. So we know that they're in a dust cloud. You can't see them with the optical light. You couldn't see them in Orion. These are the stars that are really hidden and you need the infrared to look for. And these, these are your really evolved carbon stars. And you can see that because this feature here, due to acetylene, which is very poisonous, um, is really important. So we did. We put all these together. We made these classifications. And that, that, that's the idea, is to get you guys to look, not at the Magellanic Clouds, because we've done that, but everything else that Spitzer's looked at. So the Milky Way. So this is the Milky Way taken with Spitzer. Again, the green is all the interstellar space in between. The red is the forming stars. And the blue, well, not this blue, but this blue, is um, the evolved stars and just general stars you see everywhere. We're also going to look at the Orion Nebula, which is an area which is in the Orion constellation forming lots of stars. Or even globular clusters like Omega Sem. So this is a very old cluster of stars, um, no, nothing really being born there, but lots of things dying. And then um, finally, these galaxies, these other galaxies in this sample. Um, so IC10 is one example. So can you see all this red, which I think is fantastic. You compare this galaxy to our own galaxy, you get a very different science. And so this is where I want to let you loose, because um, this is where we want to find all the really interesting objects which we can point James Webb at. And just to give you an idea, everything I've done and shown you was done with Spitzer, this tiny little mirror. Can you see this? So uh, 85 centimetres big, the mirror. James Webb, in comparison, is what we're looking for targets for, is six and a half metres. It's a bit of a difference in terms of the sensitivity, right? So, can, so all this wonderful science I've done with this, we're going to do even better and go deeper with James Webb. Um, and I just want to, yeah, and Hubble, you may have seen Hubble, just for comparison to see we are really building the biggest space telescope. We've got the very difference here. And so with James Webb, we're going to go deeper into the past. We can see that cycle of uh, stars being born and stars dying um, much earlier on. And I want to just leave you with this awesome picture of it being all put together in um, NASA Goddard in America. Thank you very much.